Hey, how's it going? Brian Kane here with the Coaching Matters Group Coaching Program, sponsored by Fundraising University. And I want to welcome everyone to today's call, this group coaching uh, program sponsored by Fundraising University. And as you know, Fundraising University is the top high school fundraising company in the United States, helping raise over $150 million for programs since its inception in 2009. And as former athletes and coaches, they understand the pain points that come with funding sports programs, and they provide the solution and support to help your programs dream big and raise more. So we'd like to take time to say thank you to any current Fundraising University coaches or administrators who have joined us on the call today. And now I just want to share with you a, a testimonial from Coach Todd Reed of Shawnee Mission West High School Baseball and his experience with Fundraising University. So this is our 12th year with the Fundraising University. Uh, doing our baseball fundraiser in the spring and over those 12 years we've raised uh, in excess of $150,000 tonight uh, with 37 kids we were able to sell a thousand cards on the nose and make $13,000 for a program. Uh, this has been great because it's afforded us the uh, ability to purchase new uniforms, purchase uh, equipment for a field, uh, pay for their meals when we go on the road uh, and, and the great thing about it is uh, Mike Bahoon and Fundraising U makes everything seamless. It's, it's very easy. They sit down with you. Uh, they put a game plan together. They actually ask you, you know, what, what type of goals do you have? Uh, how much money do you really want to raise? What do you, what do you want to spend your funds on? Um, so when they sit down with you, they um, will, will devise this, this plan where you have a first checkpoint where you try to hit a certain number, the second checkpoint uh, where you want to try to get uh, to a number that's uh, when you go out on your blitz. And we went out tonight from four to seven uh, where you can really hit the mark. And our goal this year was $13,000, which was 1,000 cards. So uh, before we went out tonight, we were at 810 sold uh, before we even went out on the blitz. So our guys did a, a tremendous job. And I can't tell you, for 37 kids to, to sell 1,000 cards and make $13,000, if you're a coach uh, and you have a, a team that has you know four teams, uh, then, you know, that there's just an incredible amount of money that you can make for your program uh, to spend any way that you really want. So super excited to have Todd share that with us and, and super excited for tonight's call with head coach Bill Moziello. He's the head baseball coach at Ohio State University. And Coach Bo is somebody who I've had a privilege to be with uh, for a long time. It goes all the way back to our days together when he was an assistant coach at the University of Tennessee and then his time at TCU with most recently uh, in, in June of 2022, accepting the position at Ohio State. Now, Tonight, right now, as we're doing this call, Coach Moziello is throwing out the first pitch at the Cincinnati Reds baseball game. So when he got that opportunity, he called me and said, Kaner, I don't know what we're going to do. Can we, can we cancel the call? Can we reschedule the call? I said, Coach Mo, it's 2022, man. We've already sent out the call. People are showing up. Let's just record it and we'll play it. So the goal tonight is I'm going to play the interview that I've done with Coach Bill Moziello from Ohio State. And at the end, we'll take some questions and break that down. Super good him talking about the role of an assistant coach, how to develop and be a great assistant coach, his path into the mental game of baseball, and how he's working to build a culture at Ohio State University. And the cool part about having the chance to work with him as a mental performance coach at Tennessee TCU and now in his head coaching job at Ohio State is he's a coach that's super into and super open to the mental game. So if you've been with us through Coaching Matters, you're now going to hear a head baseball coach talk a lot about some of the same principles, the MVP process, about advertising to your team with the mindset and the words, the pictures you put up in your locker room, two of the ones he's putting up first at Ohio State, thoughts become things and success leaves clues. So I'd like you to start by writing those two things down in your notes. Thoughts become things and success leaves clues. Now the other cool part about Coach Moziello and his buy-in to the mental game at Ohio State. As you know, Mike Bahoon, CEO of Fundraising University, is as into the mental game of baseball and the mental game of performance as any CEO in America. Mike was a competitive athlete. He was a coach himself. He coached baseball at Creighton, coached baseball at the University of Michigan. Now he is on staff in Columbus with Bill Moziello at Ohio State, working with some director of operations, player development, specializing in leadership training and mental performance. Coach Moziello is so into mental performance that he's got Mike Bahoon there every single day to reinforce what we're doing and have a 
a presence on campus in his program in mental performance. It's the only program I know of in America in college sports that basically has a full-time mental performance person on staff. So that's the level of buy-in you're gonna hear from Coach Mo. Uh, his passion is evident, his commitment to greatness is evident, and I'm super excited to bring Coach Bill Moziello onto the Coaching Matters group coaching program. Thanks for being here, everybody. Let's take a listen. Hey, how's it going? Brian Kane, host of the Coaching Matters group coaching program here and super excited to welcome Bill Moziello. He's the head baseball coach at Ohio State University, guy who's been a friend of mine here for over a decade since we first started to work together at the University of Tennessee and then had a great run together in Fort Worth at TCU and super excited to bring Coach Mo on to Coaching Matters to talk about his background, his experience in coaching. You know, he's had an amazing career as an assistant coach and been in a lot of great stops, a lot of amazing programs. So He's going to share some tips on how to be a great assistant coach and now as a head coach, the culture that he's trying to establish in Columbus, Ohio. Coach Mo, thanks for joining us here with Coaching Matters. Brian, thanks for having me, buddy. Always a great, always a pleasure to be with you. Yeah, man, excited. You know, Mo, it's, uh, we, we met at the University of Tennessee when obviously Dave Serrano was the head coach there, and then we worked together at TCU with uh, Coach Slosnagel and, and both Kirk Sarlos as the head coaches there. And now I got the awesome privilege to work with you in Columbus at Ohio State, and, and, and uh, you as the head coach, you know, which is super exciting. But your background and your experience in college baseball like, is second to none. So could you kind of take us all the way back to like the Cerritos days and kind of your career path into how you got into be the head coach at Ohio State? Yeah, you know, I, I've always told everybody that there's a lot of bit, lot better coaches than me, but nobody's had the better experiences than me. Nobody has been more blessed than I have to be around amazing coaches, amazing assistant coaches, and then the players that I've got to coach or manage throughout the years are, are second to none. So it's just been an amazing blessing. And, and for me, I'm very faith-based, so God's always had a plan for me, and I always thought I had my own plan and always wanted to have things done yesterday. And God just had always told me, hey, I got a plan for you, just stay patient be loyal, kick butt in whatever you do, and, and just go from there. Um, um, you know, and, and to be truly transparent, and the only way that I know how to be is I've always hated being an assistant coach. I, I never wanted to be an assistant. I wanted to be a head coach. I wanted to be a head coach 36 years ago when I started the profession. I was a guy that believed that I could be a head coach at that time. Thank goodness I wasn't. I've grown so much and evolved daily, and I could have been a head coach years ago, but I wouldn't be close to as successful as I hope to be, or at least doing it the right way because of all the people I've been around and all the things that I've learned. Um, and, and again, too, another thing would be is when I was an assistant, I never felt I was an assistant. Like I've been so blessed to have such prominent roles and, and my coaches really valued me that I worked for. And, and I like felt like it was my team. And I never believed for one second that it wasn't my team. Obviously, as a coach and as a employee, you always have a pecking order. So you have to understand that there, you work for somebody. You know, so, um, you know, I, I knew that. So, but yet I, in my heart, in my mind, in the way I attacked things, the way I taught daily was like, this is my club. Because to me, when you're an assistant, it is your club. Nothing bothers me more than when I hear an assistant say, well, if it was my team, we would do A, B, and C. Hmm. Well, if you're an assistant, it is your team. So if you don't believe in certain things, you need to have the guts to talk to your head coach, or even if you're an employee, talk to the boss and say, hey, why do we do it this way? Man, I really think we could be more efficient if we did it this way. And then you have to realize that, hey, he's your boss. So if you don't present it well and don't have some conviction, then he may say, forget that. I don't like the way you approached me. You didn't have a good enough plan. We're going to do it how we do it. You know what I mean? So, And then you have to know that once you leave the meeting, good. You wash your hands with it. Thank you for the time. I really appreciate you. And then you go with what the head coach tells you or whoever your boss is. So that's why I've always attacked. And I've just been around so many different assistants that always were blaming the head coach for why things weren't going well. And man, we should do it differently. You're, it's your team. Again, the one thing about an assistant as an employee, you're never going to think, believe 100% what your coach tells you or, the, or your boss tells you. And you're always going to complain a little bit to other people, which isn't right, but I'm human and I would do that. But when I thought it was prominent or even things that, that I would maybe complain a little bit about, my head coach knew how I was thinking. So I wasn't ever talking behind his back. I had brought the same things, same things up. He just maybe wasn't able to change or willing to change. So I may complain a little bit. But again, I'm not saying that's right and that shouldn't be done um, because there's nothing worse than doing that because loyalty 
has got to probably be the number one trait you have to have to be an employee or an assistant coach. It's awesome. And Mo, you know, you've talked about some of the, some, that you've been around a lot of great coaches. If we go back, you know, I think if we go back to when you, 36 years ago, when you first became an assistant coach, do you list off some of the schools that you had a chance to be a, to, to be a part of in, in those head coaches. And I think when people hear the list of programs you've been a part of, the list of head coaches you've been around, it's, it's super impressive. So, you know, it started with me as I, I was played, played at Fresno State out of high school for the great Bob Bennett. And then I did struggle in school, got a little homesick. So I went to a junior college the next year. And that's where my whole life changed. Although being with Coach Bennett, we, we'll talk about him during this podcast. What an amazing mentor and the discipline and structure. And, and I learned some things that I didn't want to be to make players feel a little more free to talk to because he was you know, old school and, and the, the deal with Coach Bennett was he was actually an amazing guy with a great personality and sense of humor, but you never found that out because you were afraid to talk to him until I got a little older and then I was like, geez, I could have talked to him the whole time and he's amazing. So I, I was with him and then I went to Cerritos College and that's where I met George Horton was my coach. His first year as a head coach at Cerritos College and we were able to win a state title. So when I went back to Fresno, um, I ended up having my fourth knee surgery. I had two at Cerritos in one season. And then right after my my uh, junior year at Fresno State, I knew I was going to have my fourth knee surgery. I wasn't going to be able to answer the bell. Um, well, I thought I was, but we thought going in it was going to be a scope. It ended up being a little re reconstructive surgery. So I'm not going to be able to coach again. So Coach Horton offered me a job to be back with him at Cerritos College during my senior year. So that's how I was able to start coaching so soon. Um, and we were able to win a state title immediately and go 46 and five. And so I was with Coach Horton for 87, 88, 89, 90. Four years of just awesome. Uh, maybe three state titles there in the four years. It was an absolute amazing run. Um, and then then he Augie Garrido had come back from Illinois in a two year hiatus. And George Horton and myself went to Cal State Fullerton with him. And again, this is where the division one thing, and this is where it became really real. So I was there for two years. We played for a national title in 92. And then the University of Tennessee hired me with a guy named Rod Delmonico. And they hadn't been to a regional in 51 years, but he had this amazing vision and great ideas off the field. Um, he was from Florida State, his previous as an assistant and a great recruiting coordinator. So I was there for him with two years, two amazing years. We won a couple SEC titles and then Ole Miss came calling and called me over to Ole Miss where I got to work with an ex big league player, star player named Don Kessinger. And everybody had told me, don't take this job. He's going to be fired. Um, and I remember thinking as arrogant as I was and you know, having no clue in the profession. Well, he doesn't get fired if I do my job. And if I do my job well, he doesn't get fired. So we were real fortunate in 95. We had there was amazing seniors that were coming back that I'd played against them the year before and knew how good of players they were. And they shouldn't have been going back for their senior year, but somehow they were. So I took that job and we were able to win 45 games, hmm. a school record at the time, um, and lost to Florida State to go to Omaha. So what an amazing run we had in one year. And then I was offered a job at the University of Oklahoma. And it was really looking back, I did a horrible job of leaving Coach, Coach Kessinger the way I did. Um, Larry Koshell from Oklahoma, they had just won a national title and went to three World Series in a three three World Series, one of them being a national title in a four-year span. And Koshell had convinced me that, hey, you can get closer to California. 18 of his 25 players on his national title team were from California. So, I, you know, I still look, missed Oklahoma. California and wanted to go back a little bit. He had convinced me, but I didn't handle it right with Coach Kessinger. And I was chasing things like I got another job. And, and, and at, at that time, I was offered 50% of camps, which was unheard of anywhere, but especially in the SEC. So when I talked to some of my other people, hey, you know, I got this opportunity and they're like, you have to take it. 50% of camps. That's incredible. So I took it. Um, unfortunately, Ole Miss only won 17 games that year, and Coach Kessinger lost his job. And I've, I've always felt regretful that I didn't stay with him to, to do a great job for him. So I, I looking back, I felt horrible. Great opportunity at, at, at um, Oklahoma. So I was there for six years, um, and then I went to Arizona State for a year with the great Pat Murphy, who was unbelievable. He was different than anybody I've ever been around before or since. Um, a really special man with with 
uh, different thoughts and different visions. He was the first guy I ever met that really thought outside of the box. And then I, I was only there for a year knowing I was only going to be there for a year. And then I went to the New York Yankees for, for five years, which was an amazing experience. And getting to be involved in professional baseball changed my whole career because I had, I learned to have more empathy and compassion for players and for me to learn how hard it was to play the game of baseball. And we had to play 140 games and nobody despises losing more than me. Mm -hmm. But if we won 80 to 90 games, which is an awesome minor league season, I had 60 nights or 70 nights of losing. And I had to fake it till I make it when I wake up the next day and pretend that we didn't even lose the night before. And we were always on the verge of a 10 game win streak. So you had to really flesh it. I would have tough nights sleeping in my hotels and places I work, but I have an ability to come back the next day like we didn't lose and let's get after it, you know, and we're going to win a million games in a row is always my thought process. So then by doing that, the University of Southern Cal offered me a job when I'm with the Yankees and I, I like professional baseball, but there was this chance of going back to California and living. And I had known what the, what the coach before me was making. And I asked for double the money that he was, knowing that they couldn't do it. But for some reason, they did do it. But I was too dumb, and I had to make a decision in three days. I had no idea that the property taxes and all the different taxes that, that my house in Arizona, where I'd been living, my, my mortgage, the property taxes in California were more than my mortgage on a 3,500-square-foot home and then trying to live in California is a whole subject within itself, you know, within itself. So I had to leave there in one year and go to the University of Auburn um, because, because I couldn't afford to buy a house. My family was living in Arizona, no chance for me to buy a house in, in California. And I had told them, if you guys don't get me a house out here in Pasadena or Manhattan Beach would be a dream for me there, um, then I have to leave. So I had to go to Auburn and, and, and there I got to work with a, a younger head coach at the time named um, Tom Slater was a fantastic young coach, and he really relied on me. And but I was only there for one year, um, and then I was able to go to the the, the uh, California Angels at that time for three years and manage and in, in, in single A for two and double A in one and one and be around the great Mike Sosha, who to me is as good a baseball man as I've ever been around. And he thought like a college coach, even though he was a established major league coach. So that was an amazing opportunity to be with him. And then in my third year there. Dave Serrano, a trial, childhood friend of mine, got the job at the University of Tennessee. And my my life in Tennessee was so awesome. I, my two years there before I was married and my wife had got to go down there and she fell in love with Knoxville like I did. So we, the money's not even close in college, minor league managing and, and SEC baseball. So we were able to triple our money and, and change our lifestyle because professional baseball, you're around, you're away from your kids and it's an absolute nightmare. The baseball part, you learn so much and you play every day and you learn to develop players and you learn empathy and compassion. And so there's so many awesome parts and you learn how to play the game a little different way than what I would call the so-called college game. The professional game was right up my alley and, and trusting your players and doing things that I've taken from that. Um, so I was there and I had to go to the University of Tennessee and um, I loved being there, but it was, a you know, when you got the game had changed with recruiting and early early commits and all that, and we were way behind at Tennessee from the players that Vanderbilt was signing in South Carolina at that time, and and actually the whole SEC for that matter. Um, and then, but I but I had known this is what I signed up for. I didn't get to run offenses and do things that I've always done, but I was going to be the recruiting coordinator. I was with a great friend. I thought we had a great staff put together, but I knew what I signed up for. And Dave Serrano, just an amazing friend, coach, person you know, all the above. He had known it was tough on me because I wasn't running things like I'd always done, but I was handling fine. And I knew that I signed up for it, but he always had kept telling me that, um, you know, Hey, if the right job goes, you may have to take it. But I said, Hey, I signed up to be here with you. And then Jim Schlossnagel at TCU, I'd been watching from afar, the great job that he'd been doing and, and he's culture driven and, uh, he has established a toughness and Coach Schlossnagel, and I hadn't met him yet, really. I'd met him as, a, as an assistant years ago when he was at Tulane, and I'd always had an appreciation for him and his hard work. Um, so he calls Dave and he says, uh, um, hey, I'm looking for an assistant coach, and here's what I want from him, A, B, and C. And Dave said, I've got the perfect guy for you. I've got the best coach in America for you that can do everything that you want. And so Dave said, let me talk to Mo. 
Dave gives me a call and I said, hey, Dave, I'm not leaving you. I, I signed up for this to be with you and see this through. And Dave said, hey, um, I think you need to talk to him. Because Jim Schlossnagel said, hey, hey, I'm calling him anyways, even if you won't listen. And Coach Schlossnagel gave me a call. And we decided to meet when he was coaching the USA team. He has this amazing ability to do 100 things at one time. He's as driven as any coach I've ever been around. He's as prepared as every any coach. So um, he I, he flew me to USA while he's coaching a team. We met 6 o'clock in the morning. I told him my vision. Here's what it looks like. I had known that if I ever got an opportunity to run an offense and do things, this is how it was going to have to be. And Coach Schlossnagel was absolutely unbelievable and said, okay, hey, that I – this is what we will do this is what we will become and he gave me the opportunity and then man it was storybook we went to four world series in a row i got to be with him learn everything what it is to be a coach off the field and then part of the big reason i took the job at tcu is if you want to take a job and win you better hook yourself up with an amazing pitching coach and i had known kirk sardos at that time he's only been coaching for two years but all my friends and Dave Serrano and my Fullerton buddies had spoken so highly of him. I had met him and watched him from afar and the great career he'd had as an All-American pitcher, major league pitcher. Um, and, and, and I got to meet him and, and his wife, and, and I'm all in. And so I signed up to be with Jim Schlossnagel because the program builder, and I'm hooking my wagon to Kirk Sarlos because the amazing human being he is. And boy, did I make the best decision of my life. Coach Schlossnagel, what he was able to teach me and what I observed from him, what a culture really looks like and how it's created, even though he had done a great job creating his for eight or nine years, but I was able to bring who I am and Kirk was able to bring who we were and we believed in the culture. We all have different styles, but we all know that the culture is our culture and um, we believed in the vision and we went to four World Series in a row. Um, then we went to a few regionals. And once you've gotten a World Series four in a row, you think you're supposed to win every year. The COVID caught us with a really good club, um, but we were still able to win seven, S seven Big 12 titles in eight years, four World Series, be a national seed five times. Four, it was maybe four times and we still went to the World Series once when we weren't. So five national seeds, which is impossible to do in college baseball, especially when you're at a private school, which that's a whole nother issue. Um, but that move being around them the amazing kids i really learned i've always known it's about your players but the people that i surrounded myself with the players that i got to coach you know i would always get people say hey, and they would tell me hey we really appreciate what you did for me and you you know how you helped mold me and the appreciation how much i love them and it was like i learned i took so much more away from the players than they took from me and I'm not a humble guy. I'm not afraid to, to be aggressive and tell you what I think and what can happen. So I'm not saying this just to say this. They taught me so much more about living a life and what it looks like and putting more on your plate than just being a ball player. And, and it was part of Jim Slosh's name of this culture. And I got to see Kirk Sar Sardos and his family. And this is the kind of man that I want to become with Kirk Sardos. And I had a lot of those characteristics as it was, family first like Kirk, but getting to watch him and falling in love with him and his family. And uh, awesome. Awesome. these are the kind of impacts that people like that have had on me. And supposedly I've been able to do some of these things with my players and families. Um, so it's, it's amazing. And now you're the head baseball coach at the Ohio State University in Columbus, Ohio. And what, what a track record. I mean, if we just go back and go through this. And, and Mo, you know, I, I, because you've had so many amazing places that you've been, it's hard. You know, I, I, had for, I didn't realize you were with Bob Bennett, man. My, I picked up Bob Bennett's The Art and Craft of Pitching, I think it was, oh. when I was in college. And going, I remember going through, through that book. And you go from the legend Bob Bennett at Fresno to George Horton, who won a national championship in 04 at Cal State Fullerton, one of the greatest junior college coaches in the history of Southern California, which is the mecca of junior college baseball 
and we've both been in Texas, but Southern California, it's a little, little bit different. And then you go and you're with Augie Garrido, who's arguably the greatest coach in the history of college baseball, five national championships over four decades, three at Cal State Fullerton, two at the University of Texas. Then you go with Rod Delmonico, who's got just under 900 wins in the SEC, or just under 800 wins in the SEC at the, as the head coach at Tennessee. You go with Larry Koshell, who won a national championship at Oklahoma with Don Kessinger, and then you're with Pat Murphy, and then you're with the New York Yankees, you're there at USC, you're with Auburn, you're with the Angels, you're at Tennessee, TCU, not Ohio State. What a journey, man. I mean, there's a whole nother, there's a whole nother podcast in here where we have more time and you give lessons that you learn from each of those coaches. But the one I got to ask you about, because I have a bobblehead, I got two of these coaches, I have bobbleheads in my office. Obviously, Sosnagel, who was where kind of we met, um, you know, after Tennessee, but, but Augie. Talk about Augie Garrido, because he was uh, different in that the guy won over four decades. He was the all-time winningest uh, college baseball coach in the country, which, make, which makes him the all-time winningest coach in, in any sport in NCAA history because they play more games. And, you know, he's a guy that uh, was instrumental in the mental game, which is part of how we met. Talk about Augie and his influence in you and the way that you go about doing things. You know, he he's the most – I don't even know what you used to wear. You can't emulate him. He was completely different. He thought different. He acted different. He was like a, a college basketball coach, like Rick Pitino and those guys that were going to, that wore the fancy suits and things. And he was doing things when he wasn't even making great money. I don't know how he was driving his Mercedes and doing all the things that he was doing. You know, he wasn't that coach that went out recruiting. Not once my days were there, he never went out recruiting one time from 1991 to the rest of his deal. Um, he was great in the houses and he was great when you brought players on campus. So he did it a complete different way than, than today's coaches and all that. And it was just part of his beauty and just, he was so passionate about winning and developing men. And um, it, it was just, it's hard to describe. You, you really, he taught me how to put a tie on. He taught me what Armani suits look like. And um, if I, if I drank, he could have taught me about wine and fine foods. And but I'd rather go to a fast food place and be on a rush and go see the next recruiter, get my go with my family than do the things. He just he was amazing. And 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 I got to see him at the end of his life, you know, and, and coach against him at the end of his run at TCU when we were having great success against him. And um and he he had changed so much and now he was a really appreciative of everything and everybody. And but he was just so different. And he wasn't his genius really wasn't the strategies and things like he might want to bunt not for any strategic reasons to show you that we play as a team and that our number three batter although he's the best hitter in the country it's first and second nobody out and i'm going to bunt basically to know that he's going to it's going to help our team understand yes it'll help us win but i need you to understand that here's our best player that plays for the team you know he didn't care if the opponents knew his signs he just didn't care we're going to execute and go out and beat you so he brought that different thing with you. Um, George Horton was more of pitch to pitch. And I learned baseball genius on like, hey, we're going to be bunning here. And now this can happen. Now we're going to steal. And we're going to steal here when nobody thinks we're going to run. And, and that wasn't Augie, although he could pull things out of his hat. He may do a miracle deal where hey, this guy hasn't played in three weeks. We're going to start him. And the guy hits two doubles to help us win. You know what I mean? He just had genius when it came to that. Um, he just, they were, he was so completely different. He's the exact opposite of me, super articulate, spoke really well. When you listen to him speak, you're, list, you're learning. I'm all over the place. I have the passion he has in different avenues. But he was just so neat, you know. You know, they, they would say things. When he went to Illinois, they gave him an unlimited budget, and he still overspent his unlimited budget. You know what I mean? He was just the most amazing man, um, just so different. And again, you just you know he lived in the Balboa Bay Club. Even when he was when he was coaching at Texas, somehow from November on he went to the Balboa Bay Club. He didn't stay in Austin at the time for years. And like, how does he do this? Yeah. You know, he was just so amazing. And you couldn't you met him, you loved him. He made you feel great. Um, I just I can't explain just my my being able to cross paths with him for a couple of years, and then the last five six years of his life coaching against him and then talking to him more than I ever did when I coached with him. It was just amazing just to see him, but nobody can ever be like him. And again, it wasn't the baseball stuff that you learn, but you had commitment to playing as a team and, and those things you loved, um, yeah. you know, were awesome. 
but it wasn't really the, the exact hey he didn't teach me how to recruit he didn't teach me how to but like he he would i would see a player that i loved hey augie we got need to go in his house seven o'clock tomorrow on the drive over we would talk about his strengths and weaknesses and he could go in and talk to the family it was like he'd seen him play 30 times you know what i mean like how did you do that so quickly so you just you just god he was just amazing at the man he was and the myth that he became and the winningest coach of all time and it wasn't lost on me at the time i had known how amazing he was um but it's just one of those experiences like i said being real faith-based like i am god put him in my life for two years um and just to get to see a little different from all the you know baseball guys that i've been around he was a man of he was he was richard Gere in a baseball uniform is what he was to me <laughs> Uh, Don Johnson in a baseball uniform. I yeah. love it. You know? I mean, he looks like Richard Gere a little yeah. bit, you know, and he could yeah. have been, you know, and, and he was great friends with Kevin Costner even then, and they became, so it was just, he was, he was different and amazing. The, you know, it's amazing that, yeah, that if we track back, right? So you're at Cal State Fullerton, 1992 with Augie, you're with the angels with Sosha for three years and two, and then you're you're at Arizona State with Pat Murphy. So two icons in mental performance, which we talk a lot about, you know, in in, in coaching matters. Ken Revisa, who was a professor at Cal State Fullerton and was there, you know, 1992. Uh, he and then and then uh, you were with him with the Angels, I believe, when he was working with the Angels with Sosha and that organization. And then Harvey Dorfman, who I know was really instrumental in Pat Murphy's life. I believe Pat actually has a tattoo dedicated to Harvey Dorfman. Like I have a tattoo dedicated to Ken Revisa and this. Right. Um, would you talk about those two guys and your experience with Revisa and Dorfman? You know, they were, they were actually a little similar in a lot of different ways. Harvey, I got a chance just to sit with him and would talk about it. He had great experiences with the Oakland A's and, in their in their uh prime when things were going great and just very soft-spoken um just incredible wealth of knowledge um really a big believer but he wasn't a huge talker he was the one that maybe you did more of the talking to him ken revisa was was although they were the same there as in sort of their personalities ken was a little more excitable way more talkative he asked quite more asked questions you answered them you could ask questions to him he you know i had known he set the bar with the the older fullerton days um with dave snow and the great success they had um you know what i mean so they, they were really neat you know ken different styles for different hardy ken might during the game you know guy gave up a winning run gave up a run might come sit by the guy which sort of drove me a little crazy like ken get with him a little later harvey would have talked to him at different time you know what i mean but ken's genius and so ahead of the game and um, I thought Hardy kept it was such a simplistic guy and what his beliefs were. He would talk about Greg Maddox and some of those things. And then Ken, although it was a simplistic, he had a lot more, more literature out there and certain things you could read up on and had a lot more layers, I would guess. A lot more layers. Maybe if I'd spent more time with Harvey like I did with Ken, I would have maybe he had more layers too, but it was very little when I was with him for that short period. But Ken, you just liked how he was ahead of the game and how much stuff he had out there. So it was just, it was a super blessing for me at that time. And, and Brian, you're still the one that really sold me out. I knew how important those guys were, but in those programs, it was professional baseball and even Arizona state, it wasn't the man and it wasn't, we, they, we didn't get to meet with them enough. You know what I mean? So you only got out of it. What you got, what you, you know, if you could really pick things up quickly, then it, you know, then you're good. And if you believed in it at that time, so many players didn't really believe in it. It didn't become a lifestyle for them. So a lot of them, except for the the smart ones and the lucky ones, didn't get close to as much out of it, you know. And then Brian being with you, and I had one encounter at Tennessee where, as coaches, we didn't teach it as well. We didn't stay on it. Your, your presentation thing was awesome, but us as coaches didn't teach it daily. We although dave bought into it we just didn't stay on it enough and i got to see well it doesn't matter if you have the greatest teacher in the world come in and teach for two days if you don't teach that same message daily it's worth nothing you know and then at, at, at tcu where jim slosh did an amazing job of really teaching it daily you know like whereas i may be working with the hitters and base runners and things one of his duties which he knew he was really good at that he stayed with is he taught that daily to individuals and it freed us up a little bit on doing what we were doing and then he could really focus on the metal game 
whereas I may in a, during an at-bat really learn what a player is doing physically, and maybe I didn't notice that he didn't do a great job with his breathing, uh, Coach Lashley would do a great job of noticing that, man, in-bat routine was terrible, that he could talk to him about. Um, although I did pay attention to it, I knew the value, and I knew everybody's marks, hey, Joe Schmo looks at the flag pole or looks at the third base pole or, you know, just looks at his batting gloves. I did know those things, but maybe caught in the moment, get, moment giving signs and things, maybe I didn't notice what the player was doing, mm-hmm. you know. So, although I knew the value of it and, and I was I was 200 feet in that this is who we were going to be. And that's why, Brian, I always knew when I had my own program, Brian Kane is going to be a part of my program. That's how much I believe in it. It's not about eyewash. It's not about just doing something and do something. It's something to help you have great success and to take you through the tough times and you continue to do it even when the great time. And it becomes a lifestyle and it becomes a part of you. Mm. You know, and, and t- talk about, you know, it's really interesting that you mentioned the the, the difference between what, what our experience was at Tennessee and then going to TCU where you saw Jim as a head coach being able to reinforce it every day. In your perspective, does it have to be the head coach that reinforces it every day or does there have to be head coach buy-in and someone who's there that's kind of had that, that's sort of their, their deal and the thing they're into is running that mental performance culture every day. How does that, how does that look like for you? Yeah. Number one, it has to be, everybody has to be all in. Now, somebody, one person on your staff needs to be the one that daily and does all the touches and does the checks. So it wouldn't matter to me who does it. Your head coach, the, the person that's in charge, needs to be all in and, and believing on it. And then he's the one that delegates, man, you do this really good. You might do this better than me. I want you on top of it. Mm-hmm. But everybody in the program, need, it, it can't be, well, I heard him talk, and I'll just let everybody else do the work. You better be you you better be all in, too. Again, it, it wasn't my role during the game to have to for sure tell him. But if I had noticed something, hey, man, you, you got out of control, you could see it. You didn't do anything. I, I can go up and touch it. But it's great to have somebody in your organization that's on top of daily, just like the pitching coach with every pitch a guy throws. The mental game coach is going to notice every single thing that happens. Mm. But I, I think it's one of my things in my programs is when it, when it, when you have a boss or a head coach, what he needs to be selling, is it needs to be as important to you as it is to him. It can't be something where he buys into it, but you as an employer or as an assistant don't really buy into it. You better all be buying into it and know how important it really is. And part of being a boss and a head coach is you need to sell that to them. And and, and it's got to be part of, hey, if you don't buy in this as an employee or an assistant, then you can't be a part of this program. You know what I mean? Like, I don't don't think that it gets to be, I mean, I don't think you can go into anything with just one foot. You need to be two feet, especially the mental game, because it's something you carry with you in every single thing you do. So I just think in, in in a thing like the mental game, it has to be all in from everybody. But I think it does good to have one person, maybe it's the point person that's completely in charge. Yeah, like that's kind of like strength and conditioning. Everybody believes strength and conditioning is essential to run in a great program, but you have a strength coach that that runs that part of it, you know? And it's interesting, Mo, when you talk about getting everybody on the same page and we talk about culture, and I know, you know, when we've talked, uh, when you were going through the process with with the job at Ohio State, you know, we talk, you talked a lot about the importance of clarifying and implementing a culture and a culture of Ohio. And what I want to do here is share for our Coaching Matters community here uh, a visual, right, an example of what, what that looks like. And would you kind of talk, Mo, as, as a head coach, the importance of having, you know, a culture and something on paper like you have this MVP process. Well, how important is this for you as a head coach to kind of guide the culture of your program? Yeah, so, so number one, you, Brian, you're the one that taught me all this and got me to really believe in it. You know, you're the one that's come up with the stuff, and we've always talked through it. Um, I'm a guy that's really I, – I despise the words on a wall. I despise when I go into a high school or other program, and they've got 50 different things on the wall. And they're all awesome, and they all mean something, and they all have huge value. But when you talk about what culture really is, is like it needs to be defined. Every player needs to know. And that's, Brian, you had talked about that early in our TCU career because even the TCU program was great, great job as uh, Jim had done in it. Like it was a little, if you asked some, them a certain thing, players were had a little mixed messages. And they were all sort of the same, but they were a little mixed. And you decided that year, it might have been actually my first year at TCU, that we needed to really define what our culture is and obviously the simpler the better 
So us with our, our Ohio is just very simple. And I want to, you know, being entrenched in Ohio, and I need to really show how important it is. And, and, and loving Ohio was, it was simple for me to just say, hey, Ohio, you know, the O will be for ownership. The H for hardworking, the I for integrity, and the O for one pitch at a time. But it can't just be them. It has to be even defined even more like it has on this where it talks about ownership. And I want them to understand what does that mean? Um, you know, so the ownership for us is responsible for personal process and results, always putting the team first. And then with the H, the hardworking, always on the attack, bringing a relentless energy in everything you do. The integrity is doing what you what you say you will do and, and doing what's right, which is always in si simple. If you do what's right, you're always going to be great. And then the one pitch at a time is present moment, present moment, moment focus, living and competing where our feet are. So at first we'll have the words on the wall where they know that, but we're going to have to spend once a week talking about exactly what these mean, what these mean. And my deal was is that if any player it better be after two, three months, says, hey, what is your Ohio State program about? And it's going to be very simple, Ohio. And then they would tell them what it is. And almost word for word, they're going to be able to tell you what ownership, hardworking, integrity, and one pitch at a time is. I think you need to clarify it. And I think it needs to be as, as much as a baseball person as I am, like swinging a bat, this culture piece has to be as important as – the, as swinging a bat. So if I'm going to talk about swinging a bat daily and working on team defense, team offense and things daily, we need to talk about a culture day mm. and just touched on. And then to make a, a long story short, um, you know, I'm, I'm the guy that always talks about if you have to talk about your culture, then you don't have a culture. Mm. Um, but for me, I'm, I mean, it's, it's going to be all talking at the beginning until we become what we're going to become. But what I was going to get at is culture to me is this simple. It's how you operate. It's that simple. You could tell me we have the greatest culture ever at whatever school you're at. Well, when you meet the players and you just sit in a meeting or you watch them play, how they operate is what your culture is. You can have this fancy slogan and think that you're teaching these great things, but how your players operate is who you are. Mm -hmm. So do not kid yourself. Do not kid yourself. The way your players and people in your work behave, the way they act, the way they treat people, the way they communicate with each other, the way they love each other. That is who, what your culture is. That simple. Yeah, it's an experience you get, right? As an outsider that comes in, it's an experience that you get when you go into a program and it's a feeling you get. It's a, it's a vibe you pick up. It's an energy you experience. It's the way you interact, the way you see people interact with each other and the way they interact with you. Every day they're providing that experience that the culture is dynamic. It's always growing. It's always moving. And I think sometimes coaches make the mistake to think that like, to go back to your point, culture is words on a wall. <coughs> And, and words on a wall are important because it gives us something to come back to and it creates it creates a foundation to build off of, for example, your Ohio or SEE at TCU or CEO Street with Fundraising University or a set of values that drive behavior. But it's ultimately the behaviors that we're getting that are dictating what that culture is. Yeah, exactly. You know, I just think there's, you know, visually just something to be in every day to, be, to make you accountable. Mm -hmm. or, or when you're sitting in a team meeting and we've gotten away from – our culture and our values. And we have to say, remind them again, hey, Johnny, what does S stand for? What does O stand for? You know what I mean? Like you're forgetting that. Mm -hmm. I mean, I've been in a, in a team meeting before where we were um, two months into the dang program and we asked them because we try to be really interactive with all of our, our, our uh, mental performance meetings and things and said, hey, to the player, hey, such and such, what are, you know, what are our team values? What are, who are we? And it was on a wall and the kid didn't even know it. Mm. And he'd been in our program for two months, mm. you know, probably a reason why he wasn't there for five months. You know? <laughs> um, yeah. So, but it was, you know, it was like, it's on the wall. Even if you couldn't remember it, Oh, it was there to your right. And he didn't even know it. So what a poor job I did of teaching him mm. and us, but we were having team organizational meetings each week and, you know, guys from 10 years ago can tell you everything about it but it was just like gosh dang it and it made you say man we're not teaching it well enough and uh we're taking things for granted 
you know, we need to, and the older you have in your program, sometimes you've done it well for a while, you take things for granted, like, hey, we don't need to really do it as much because our guys are dialed in when they're not. So you need to understand the importance of that. It's every day. So I would take batting practice and field ground balls and run the bases every day. It's why John Wooden taught his guys to put their shoes and socks on because we have got to come back to the fundamentals every day, right? If we're not intentionally coaching culture, which is what I'm hearing you say, coach, is if we're not intentionally coaching culture every day, it's not going to be as strong as it needs to be for us to win. Exactly. And again, that doesn't mean you have to have a meeting over it every day. I do think you have to have at least one good touch up a week at the minimum every two weeks, but it's just everything you're talking about. You're talking to guys quickly and you're going over team offense or certain things. It's, it's gotta be brought up. You know, it's gotta be the one pitch at a time, everything we're doing, you know, and then, you know, all those type things and obviously hardworking and just, so you're just touching on the things that you're talking about every day or a player, you know, and as a group, we're not, you're not doing things right. I mean, where's your ownership, man? This is your club. How are we not doing it? So, you know, it's just all those little different things that are all encompassing on, on who you are on a daily basis. You know, it was interesting, Coach. Uh, we'll kind of bring this bring this to a close here. I got one more question. I want to be respectful of your time and our members here with Coaching Matters and their time. And, man, you've dropped a ton of knowledge here. If we go back, you started with the characteristics of an assistant coach. You talked about your career and, and journey and the lessons learned from some legends in coaching in the game of baseball. You talked about the importance of the mental game, the importance of building a culture based on principle and the principles of Ohio, of ownership, hardworking, integrity, and one pitch at a time. As we talk this summer, you referenced two mindsets that you thought were going to be critical as you start to develop this program. And you said that there were going to be words that you put up so that those mindsets would be evident and clear every day. It was thoughts become things and success leaves clues. Would you unpack those two for us? Yeah, I mean, and, and, I, and I got them both from you. It's just that, like, and it's something that I've already known. I mean, you, you have to start, you, you got to start thinking things, man. And we've all been through it. When you start thinking negatively, of course it happens. So you've got to believe, so you got to try to get that, that self-talk out of your mind about negativity, man. And you need to think about being a winner or think about being a great father and just keep convincing yourself, you know, so thoughts become things. And then the success leaves clues. That's one thing through my life. Every great person I've been around, man, I paid attention. Why is this guy so special? And just success leaves clues, man. There's no coincidence, no coincidence. You don't luck into anything. Mm -hmm. Things can fall your way a little bit. Some things, things fall your way because of the success because of the clues that you've been leaving everywhere. And I just think that, man, you need to start thinking like that. Every team you've been around, every individual, you know what I mean? It's just like, man, I, and every, you know, I've been around so many special people in different walks of life. This guy's a great businessman. This guy's a great pastor. Um, and you just like, and you just, success ooze, oozes out of them. Like, no wonder this guy's so great. You know what I mean? And, you know, so it just, but it, and those are the two things that'll be on our, we're still, our graph. They're, they're not up yet, but we've had to pay, pay a pretty penny for them, and that's how much I believe in them. Mm. I need the players to see them all the time. Mm. They're going to hear it from me all the time. I'm one of those corny coaches that has a lot of sayings that I use. The problem is, is I believe them 1 million percent, and I'm going to just convince them and brainwash them through why I believe in them. Mm. Um, so, but those are, you know, so a couple of things that I thought were so important were staples for me in the program that I talk about daily um, and that I live daily. And I'm going to demand that they live them daily. Because I want, and, and if this isn't about baseball, this is about anything in their life, that those two things would help them have success. Mm. And I love that you say, you know, this, this is about more than baseball. And when you talk about more than baseball and in the, in the mission of the program, you've talked about building better people through baseball. Why is it important for you, Mo, to build better people through baseball? Because that's what life's about, man. As I've learned, the more years you coach, be, the person they become is so much more important than the player they become. Like that's my mission is to build men, to to raise my kids, to set an example. We're gonna screw up, especially human. And when you're talk as much as I do, and you're just a minute, you know, God puts you there. The devil really wants to get you. The more you talk the more the devil wants to, to get you and find holes in you. So, man, the more you talk and the more you believe in things, you got to become even better at them because people want to poke holes in you as quick as they possibly can. And I don't take that lightly. But building people, that's what it's about. And I, and I really know through our program, it's a holistic approach. 
We're going to build from the ground up a better person, a better husband to be, a better boyfriend, a better, better teammate, a better father one day. And I know that if they can become the best version of themselves, they'll actually become a better player. Mm -hmm. The player is the last piece for me. I'm building all the other things. And they're obviously a talented player. We've already recruited them. But if I do my job in building them as a person, then they'll become the best version they can as, as a baseball player. And that's just, I can't quantify it, but it's through my experiences of life. And when you've done coached for 36 years, the amazing players that I've coached, they are better people than they were players. So, man, I want my players to, to reach the best version of themselves in all aspects of their life. And I know that if I help them build a person and don't let them slide on the little things and there are no little things to me that everything's just as important that I will, if I can just do the best I can to build men, then I'm, I have a chance to become a success. Mm. Coach Bill Moziello, the Ohio State University baseball program. Go Buckeyes. Coach, thank you for being here on Coaching Matters. Thank you for sharing your story. Thank you for t teaching our coaches about the importance of culture, the importance of the holistic approach to building the whole person, and that taking care of that, the player takes care of himself. And, man, get after it in Columbus. Super pumped for you for the opportunity to, to get this and get this going there, and super excited for the opportunity to be a part of your support staff, man. Thanks for coming on Coaching Matters. You crushed it today, brother. Thank you, Brian. The pleasure was all mine, as always. Awesome. So thanks, everybody, for taking a look at this. What I want to kind of do now is break down what were your big takeaways? You know, what were your big takeaways from this group coaching call here with Coach Bill Moziello? So if we would, let's take it to the chat. And inside of the chat, I just want to have you maybe put in what's the number one takeaway that you got from today. So as you're filling in the chat, uh, what's your big takeaway was from Coach Moziello, whether it's maybe around being a better assistant coach or building a program built on culture or something related to mental performance. While you're posting your comments there, I just wanted to let everybody know that Fundraising University is always looking for individuals throughout the country who are competitive, empathetic, organized, self-starters, and teachable and coachable to partner with. And for the current coaches, if you'd like to join a supportive team with the ability to earn a six-figure income, we'd love to talk with you. And all you've got to do is contact Ohio State Assistant Baseball Coach and Fundraising University CEO Mike Bahoon, mbahoon at fundraisingu.net. I'll post this inside of the chat. And just email Mike to inquire about becoming a Fundraising University rep to work with coaches in your area. Or if you're interested in becoming a franchise owner, Again, just reach out to Mike and you guys get connected and we'll take it from there. So again, I'm going to post that inside of the chat and we'll like to break down what some of the takeaways were for you. And just posted that uh, from Mike there if you're interested in joining the team. Let's go to Aaron DeBoard. Aaron, if you're with us, you talked about surrounding yourself with great people. Uh, why do you feel like that's such an important piece as, as being a coach is surrounding yourself with great people, Aaron? Good. All right. We'll come. We go. Aaron, are you with us? Um, just, because, just because when you get yourself around the right group of guys, uh, it's important for them to be able to, for, for us as coaches, to have guys we can talk to, to bounce ideas off of, tell us when you're right or wrong, have someone that you can trust to help steer you in the right direction every day. Awesome. Appreciate it. Thanks for being with us. Let's go to Coach Rexon. Coach, if you're here, Coach Brandon Rexon, you know, talking about it has to happen every day, being consistent with the message and the plan. Unpack what you took away from Coach Coach Mo there, if you would, please. Um, I think when with with young kids, I think you got to be consistent with the message. I think you got to reinforce it on a daily basis because if you don't, it's very easy for that to kind of go by the wayside, um, especially with the young, you know, the 14-year-olds. Um, you really got to get that started at a young age so that by the time they are looking at going to college and playing at that next level, that those habits are routine. Um, you're no longer having them step outside of their comfort zone because it's something they've been practicing um, on a daily basis for the last four or five years. Awesome. Thanks for, thanks, thanks for sharing that. Let's go to Coach Tom Metis. Tom, um, what did you take away from that call with Coach Bill Moziello, Tom? Also going to go to Randy Bolton, Coach Randy Bolton. If either you or Tom want to share with us, what did you guys take away from that call with Coach Bill Moziello? Sure. You know, he talked about when, you know, that culture is a lifestyle that you've got to do it all the time, not just on the baseball field, but when you're in the classroom, when you're out, you know, 
um, amongst the student body or, you know, especially in that high school level. So it's got to be something you do all the time, not just um, whenever it's convenient. Love that. Tom Minas, what'd you take away from that call with Coach Bill Moziello? Yeah, two big takeaways, surrounding yourself with, with uh, the right people. And then the second part of that is, um, you know, it's not, it's a living and breathing culture. It's not just something that you just stick up on the wall and mm. looks good, but it's lived out every single day. Yeah, and I think if everybody goes into the chat, obviously we, should, we pulled up that document of his MVP process for Ohio. And if you go into uh, our chat here, you're going to be able to see where I post a link to that MVP process so that that's something that you can, you can click on and you can actually make a copy of that. So if you're in our chat and you click on the link inside uh, of the chat, you'll come to this Ohio State University baseball MVP process. If you click file, make a copy, you can have a copy of this for you to use as a template. And if we review this... Again, whether you're whether you're you know one of the one of the biggest most elite universities in the country, whether you're a high school coach, whether you're a travel ball coach, or whether you're not a coach at all, you just want to create an MVP process for yourself. It follows the same format. So the mission, the big picture, the gravestone. What do we want people to say about us? And what Coach Moziello wants the players who go through his program at the Ohio State to say is that that the program created better people through baseball. The vision. Think about this as your resume. What is it we want to accomplish? Well, he wants to accomplish the one pitch at a time process every day, one day at a time, one pitch at a time, make the big time where you are. They want to win 40 games, win the Big Ten regular season and the Big Ten tournament. They want to host a regional, host a super regional, go to the College World Series and win the NCAA National Championship. He wants to prepare his players for success in pro baseball. They want to graduate from Ohio State. and He wants to build better people for their life. This process, number one, is to clarify and implement the culture. This is his MVP process. Number two, he wants to acquire and develop talent, his staff and his players. He understands that they got to feed themselves with the right thoughts because thoughts become things, and he wants to surround his players with the right strategies that they need to close that gap because success leaves clues. And if you think about the, the list of coaches, if you're, if you're a baseball fan uh, of amateur baseball and you're familiar with college baseball, I mean, some of the names that Coach Moziella worked with, Bob Bennett, Rod Delmonico, Augie Garrido, George Horton, Dave Serrano, Jim Slosnagel, Tom Slater, Kirk Sarlos, Larry Koshell, Don Kessinger. I mean, those are 10 world-class coaches, and I didn't even hit them all, right? I definitely left some people out there. So his story and his journey. I mean, success leaves clues. That defines Bill Moziello. Just think about from the pro ranks, Mike Sosha, the New York Yankees. He's coached, doesn't mention this. He coached Mike Trout through, the, through his minor league career. He was Mike Trout's manager when he went to Tennessee and left pro baseball. His core principles, Ohio, ownership, defined as being responsible for your process and results, always putting the team first, hardworking, always on the attack and bringing a relentless energy to everything you do. And I hope you could feel that relentless energy from coach Moziello. Anytime a guest cries on the coaching matters podcast and group coaching program, you know, you've got a winner of a session integrity, doing what you say you will do and doing what's right in one pitch at a time, present moment, focus, living and competing where our feet are above the line behavior. This is what Ohio looks like. These are the winning behaviors are going to help us win a national championship. These are the below the line behaviors that will keep us from winning a national championship. We need more above the line behavior and less below the line behavior. So if you're on this call, my challenge to you, my invitation to you is to take a copy of this Ohio State MVP process, create one for yourself and create one for your program, the program that you lead at your school, the program that you coach, the athletic department that you run as an athletic director, so that we can be together in creating that culture that's going to produce the people. And if you produce the people, you'll produce the results that you're looking for. I love that Coach Moziello talking about being a transformational program, being a holistic program that builds better people through baseball, because better people are what bring home Big Ten and national championships. Let's go Buckeyes. Let's dominate today. Thanks for being here, everybody, and look forward uh, to our marketing through Fundraising University. We'll keep an eye on that inbox for our September 2022 Coaching Matters call, where we're going to continue to build on culture. 
We're going to bring in another one of college baseball's great coaches, Cliff Godwin, head baseball coach at East Carolina University, to talk about their culture of pirates and a coach who is also going to bring some great strategies that you can use in your program to create the culture that you're looking for. Thanks for being here. Remember, it's a great day to dream big and raise more. Check out Fundraising University. If you're interested in getting more information about joining the team, send an email to mbahun, M-B-A-H-U-N, at fundraisingu.net. An Ohio State baseball coach and Fundraising U CEO, Mike Bahoon will take time to talk with you about that next step in your journey. Thanks for being here.